Hello there, and welcome back to ABLF. Now, my next guest is a prominent businesswoman and a philanthropist from Dubai. She is the director of retail at Asa Sala Al Gurg, and also she sits on the board of several companies in the region. She's very busy. I'm absolutely thrilled she's taken the time to join us since 2008. She's also the chairwoman of the Young Arab Leaders at UAE here, really promoting education and entrepreneurship and youth development in the Middle East. Please, a very warm welcome to Muna Al Gurg. Muna, delighted to see you again. Thank you, Ethna. It's a pleasure to be at ABLF and uh, wonderful to see you once again. Now, of course, there's so much going on in the region, and we were just talking about how busy the UAE has been, and the vaccination programs are being rolled out indeed here and around the region. But when we look at what's happening, I suppose, you know, on a wider scale, do you think that perhaps the worst is, is over now? Well, I mean, if you were to look at you know, the pandemic year and vaccines, uh, looking at vaccines may one day allow us to uncover our faces and bring the pandemic to an end. But considering the present case of infectious uh, variants across the world, they do, won't do much to lower uh, COVID numbers for at least the next few months. And according to statistical models by medical researchers, the number of lives saved by basic coronavirus mitigation uh, measures like masking or physical distancing uh, and testing are likely to eclipse the number of, of lives saved by vaccines at least till the end of this year. And so really the sooner people are vaccinated, which is what we were just speaking about, the quicker they're protected. Uh, if only part of the population is vaccinated, then the virus has a greater likelihood uh, of evolving and in ways that may evade the vaccine's defenses. Now, if we're really to look at the United Arab Emirates, um, the UAE ranks among the top nations uh, in terms of vaccination and has crossed the 12 million COVID-19 uh, vaccine doses uh, milestone on May uh, 22nd of this year. Uh, to end the pandemic, the virus must either be eliminated worldwide, which most scientists agree is near impossible because of how widespread it has become, or people must build up sufficient immunity through infections or a vaccine. So it is estimated that 55 to 80 percent of a population must be immune for this to happen, depending on the country. So uh, vaccinations are key, to be honest. Indeed, I think to a lot of uh, common sense and really everybody doing their bit, I think, and everybody being more cautious. I think it has been proven that it actually works. So it's uh, a lot of responsibility, self-responsibility, I think, as well. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Talk to me a little bit about how your company, um, SSL Al Gerd Group, has actually, you know, changed your operational, I suppose, you know, direction in the last uh, year and a bit. Well, that's a really good question, Ethna, and I think everyone's really thinking about uh, this from 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 a pers perspective of pivoting. And I think um, I really have a strong belief in change starts with us. At the Isa Salih Al Ghar Group, uh, we have an increased had an increased urge to drive and to be relevant and responsible in what we sell, in what we communicate, and in what we do. So once the pandemic is over, all that people will remember is if, as a business, we were relevant and responsible. Uh, let's con contextualize this. Uh, we decided in, over the last year, for example, to not make any redundancies. Uh, we want to get through this period during, you know, this difficult period together with our people. Uh, we've also closely focused on cash flow and liquidity. Uh, so we consciously decided not to embark on any over ambitious projects. Instead, we chose to sharpen our focus on profitability. And honestly, I'm very proud of the team. I'm proud of our employees. They came together um, and we really did stand together very, again, going back to the point, responsibly as a family and you know, as, as a group. Uh, and really, the last but not least is also communication. If you think about it, Etna, I mean, 
clear and honest communication is so key to this whole journey that we're on at the moment. So we had clear and honest communication with our employees, partners, uh, and clients. It was crucial to reassure people at this time because everyone was so worried. Um, and so the group was swift to undertake all possible uh, safety measures uh, for our employees. We were adhering to all government guidelines around health and safety in offices and staff accommodations. Uh, we also had to pivot from a digital point of view. Everyone started working from home. And so basically uh, the IT department was heavily loaded at the beginning in terms of taking this um, transformation forward from an IT perspective with our employees. We also addressed our customers' health and safety concerns, especially related to deliveries, clearly communicating our sanitization policies. And to be honest with you, this is something that really helped our business. It was really important that we immediately communicated about our sanitization policies on our digital platforms. So as you can imagine, as a customer, everyone was quite worried about, you know, who these delivery people are that are coming and are they sanitized? So I think it was really important for us to get that clear communication forward on our digital platforms. It made a big difference to the business. I think, as you say, it's so heartening that there were no redundancies and, again, that you kept the team there. But I also love that concept, as you say, the importance of communications internally and externally. Internally, So it's really keeping, keeping everybody together, keeping everybody in touch with what's happening. And possibly a way I would imagine that you'll be doing business in the future as well. I think we've all learned something out of this. But let's take a look at maybe the wider retail sector, you know, mm -hmm. particularly, and how it's changed, actually, in the last couple of years, when you mentioned digital there, how has digitalization been driving the retail sector? What do you think? Well, it's really at the moment, it's a time to redefine retail priorities and um, profitability dependent depended in the past on scale. Uh, with scale as a secret source, it meant that local markets and customers have inevitably been neglected. And so the time of global marketplaces is passing and businesses will need to be refitted for purpose based on the realities of their own um, markets. So really kind of customizing for uh, regional markets. And if you really think about it, uh, Athna, why would a customer go to a store right now, particularly in a pandemic, uh, but even before the pandemic, as you rightly said with digitization, products are becoming ubiquitous as are prices and offers and millennials started the trend and the younger generations following are clearly not driven by them as they become more influential in the market stores will move from being brand vendors to presenters of trends and style so customers are looking for stories right i mean if you think even about yourself as a customer um, you walk into a store and you don't just want to be sold a generic brand. You want to know, let's say, for example, about the heritage of that brand or the sustainability of that product. So and another key question really is how will new retail build its relationships and stronger relationships with customers is key. Um, and many retailers are focused now on digital marketing. There is no doubt that online presence is essential today, but with extreme also digital overload, this is also a problem. Uh, the sheer volume, and you know that yourself, I'm sure, um, of information uh, makes it extremely difficult to cut through the clutter uh, to actually create impact. And so with less customers entering the door, conversion rates need to increase exponentially. Uh, and so each aspect of the in-store engagement needs focus, better equipped and more proactive staff. So going back really to the stories that we need to tell our customers, staff need to be completely uh, trained from that perspective. Know your product, know your heritage, know your um, you know, product knowledge. Um, we need also easy access to touch and feel products, uh, more informed selling, um, again, going back to uh, the staff's knowledge in, in the store. 
Quick and easy after sales service. Again, something that the region really needs to work on. Uh, correct pricing, the list goes on. And so uh, we at the Isa Saleh Halgar group certainly saw results uh, of investing heavily in digital uh, over the last year. And we know our customers better now and our revenue has increased during a pandemic year, which is something that to be honest, we're very proud of. Indeed, you should be very proud of it, and that's very exciting news. But um, I can promise you, Mona, I'll still I'll still pop by the store every now and then. I still like oh. to do a bit of shopping. Um, but I love what you say there too, in terms of that whole shopping experience. Yes, it'll be part physical, it'll be part digital. But as you say, you know, you need to be presenters of trends style. I mean, it is so true. Everybody wants to to feel very good about that. And let's just look at the SMEs in the region and indeed anywhere. You know, SMEs are very often the very backbone of, you know, every economy and they're needed. They provide a lot of jobs and all that. What support do you think that the industry, you know, in, on a wider range can actually offer, you know, to the small players and to the small local brands to make sure that they survive and thrive? Mm -hmm. Another excellent question. And, um, Recently, His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who is actually our crown prince of Dubai, uh, launched Dubai Next. Uh, Dubai Next is a digital platform that uh, will enable innovators and entrepreneurs in the Emirate to secure funding for their projects. So it's quite a unique, uh, actually, initiative, uh, particularly because we have not had this essence of crowdfunding in the, in the region and is not, not very prevalent. And so it's built with an aim to encourage and support sharing of promising ideas through this crowdfunding platform. Uh, again, quite unique. Uh, and the in integrated virtual platform will work towards in ensuring the UAE's competitive SME sector can continue to thrive and contribute uh, to the national economy. And so owing to the digital nature of the platform, aspiring entrepreneurs are expected uh, to be able to reach out to a wider audience, both within the region and beyond, um, and gain access to better funding. Another great thing is that Dubai SME, which is our, I would say our uh, SME fund, uh, let's say, will also provide an incentives package to the projects that receive financing through Dubai Next, which is the crowdfunding platform. Um, and the package will include access to the Hamdan Innovation Incubator or one of the 14 certified incubators in Dubai, which will help SMEs to expand and scale locally and globally. And so what Dubai Next offers is an opportunity for entrepreneurs to bring ideas to life when direct capital investment can be challenging to source. And if we're to really go back and look at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in 2020, the Emirate of Sharjah uh, has an entrepreneurship uh, center called Shira. And uh, Shira created a $1 million uh, fund, so it's called the Solidarity Fund, uh, to assist startups struggling to cope with the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. And this happened very early on uh, at the pandemic stage. And to be honest, the results I've seen, again, a lot of the entrepreneurs would not have survived if that solidarity fund had not come into place. So I really believe that these government backing uh, sort of initiatives have helped SMEs uh, survive uh, and indeed, perhaps, in, uh, as we can see, hopefully grow uh, in a very difficult uh, period of time. Indeed, it is. It's great to hear that these very innovative and creative concepts are being put in place. And, um, and again, I think it's making entrepreneurs, you know, a lively, living, growing part of the community as well. I think so important when we look at that business community that um, it is, you know, what it says, that it is a community, so to speak. Now, earlier you talked about, you know, the work that all of your employees put in place. And I know how proud you are of all your employees. And I know you also involve them very much in the philanthropic work that uh, your group does. But talk to me a little bit about some of the philanthropic initiatives that you've undertaken recently. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for allowing me to share this uh, on the platform. And uh, 2020 was honestly also very transformative for philanthropy. 
And as the pandemic created a sense of urgency to support communities that needed it most, uh, the pandemic, uh, and as the pandemic hit our region, uh, we at the Isa Saleh al group uh, contributed 13 million dirhams through our charity foundation towards healthcare and e-learning needs of vulnerable sections in the UAE. And I think this was something that was an immediate need uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, healthcare and e-learning. Uh, I made a personal commitment to support the extremely vulnerable Syrian immigrant population in Lebanon through an NGO, again, during the pandemic, which was again much needed. I also feel deeply about youth empowerment, Etna, and to create a conscious new God. So in the months following the Beirut explosion, the Nawaya network uh, continued to empower marginalized youth by building their entrepreneurship uh, skills. And so through this network, I've supported 30 adults, including women from extremely difficult socioeconomic situations in their vocational training aimed at job creation. And so I, I'm sure you've read all about and heard all about the problems that happened in Lebanon over the last year. Um, again, uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about um, you know, family businesses and, and their philanthropic work uh, in the region. Data indicates also that the annual philanthropic capital of 100 of the largest GCC family businesses is estimated at a minimum of $7 billion. Uh, most of this activity is informal and ad hoc, failing to benefit from professional management and governance. And so our chairman realized this and set up the Isa Saleh al Charity Foundation over a decade ago to create a sustainable philanthropic model based on the Waqf system. And it's one of the first official family sponsored um, charity foundations in the UAE. And this was also uh, the tipping point of my personal journey uh, as I decided to build a school in Zanzibar for children who were actually in grade three and couldn't go beyond that. Um, and so last but not least, um, I have a keen interest in creating pathways for women and girls in the MENA region uh, through education, economic empowerment, and by investing in women-led social impact enterprises. And I'm not sure if you know about this statistic, but 2.3%, as little as 2.3% funding went to women-led startups in 2020, which is very, very uh, little as a as a number and and so i want to help change that and one tangible example is an investment i made in mindshift capital a global female run venture firm uh, that invests in impact oriented women led enterprises well congratulations muna there's so much work that you are doing there and i know apart from the day job and all the work you have to do i'm not sure where you fit it in but i think those initiatives you know um so so important and particularly as you talk about you know the education initiatives and also really helping women come back into the workforce but fascinating statistic there 2.3 percent clearly not good enough when we can see how women here in the region and indeed beyond can actually run you know good businesses turn a profit and you know deliver on, on an equal footing so to speak while we're just talking about philanthropy um if i may just maybe broaden it a little bit and what direction do you think that philanthropy should maybe take and particularly when it comes to helping is there a duty you think to help mm -hmm. the underprivileged and the most vulnerable in society and and in the region there seems without a doubt a lot to be done correct i think uh the spirit of giving is deep rooted in our culture uh, but we can also benefit from discovering global best practices and with it innovative approaches that can modernize and improve traditional philanthropy. So we really need to institutionalize uh, philanthropy, Ethna. And I recently comp completed a series of workshops with the Gates Foundation uh, that helped introduce me to how philanthropy is being conducted by those at the cutting edge. And so a particular focus was how one can develop a strategic framework that can shape and focus on giving. And so a critical aspect of any philanthropic effort is to create maximum impact. And so to do this, we need to have a good governance and make decisions based on analysis. Uh, data is often weakest in the geographies and communities that need the most help. 
And so there is no single database with granular information on all the socioeconomic conditions that we need to make informed decisions about giving. So I really believe that they, data is uh, an important aspect of how we can improve in the region in terms of our giving. Yes, and I think building that database is absolutely essential because people are then more engaged, more educated, indeed more informed about what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes left here and I have a few important questions and some questions coming in from many of our viewers too. So I'd like to maybe put two in one for you in terms of thinking about everybody looks at the business model and really looks at about building agility into a business model when we think about you know dealing with the shocks of the pandemic and that. But I have a question here also from Ahmed Suleiman in Egypt, and it, it kind of ties in, or perhaps you might be able to tie in it, you know, about the tough decisions that leaders have to make, you know, mm -hmm. when there's harsh financial conditions as well. So I guess agility ties into that, you know, Correct. so making those decisions, taking that ownership, that leadership, and ultimately making decisions that will benefit, you know, the organization in the long run and creating, I suppose, a win-win a if that's possible when times are tough. No, absolutely, absolutely. Agility is 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 key. And so agility, but also robustness are two characteristics that help businesses navigate unknowns. I think agility is an easier element for a business to commit itself to, being aware of one's surroundings and having fast feedback mechanisms to understand how customer behavior is changing and how your products or services fit in their respective markets can all make a business agile. Agility is something that characterizes many successful businesses that operate in, in competitive markets. But robustness is also important, uh, but can be harder to carry through a full business cycle as it usually entails carrying some form of redundancy. Uh, we, if you look at it, let's say a factory may, may need to be more robust from uh, a machinery point of view. Uh, a team needs to be more robust from a manpower point of view. So a lot of business leaders, it's very tempting for them to look at this uh, as a cost to optimize away. Uh, that said, there are smart, light ways to ensure robustness. Uh, the increasingly digitized nature of many work functions means that physical location and communication are no longer critical bottlenecks, as you can imagine. Uh, and it's been uh, the physical side of the pandemic that has seen supply chain disruptions. Uh, so by definition, it's hard to build a business that will withstand all unknowns, but we have more tools available to us today than ever before. So technology can honestly help also. And again, when it comes to making those tough decisions, I suppose it is about really looking holistically at the business and mm -hmm. you know, making sure, and as you did, you know, making sure you can do what you can to keep everybody employed. I mean, I think, and we heard these stories around the region, you know, you probably had to stand back and, and, and I think what you also talked about communication, how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we spoke about this before. Um, communication is key to, to, uh, you know, taking things forward and to kind of uh, reassuring people during a very, very difficult time. And so uh, I think getting the right communication out there, whether it be to your business partners or your employees or to the greater wide customers is, is, is just key. Now, talk to us a little bit about really, you know, what can be done to ensure that youth capital is really protected and empowered in the region. That's a question I wanted to ask, but it matches up with the question I have here from uh, Karan Sunil from Bangalore in India, talking about what advice you would give for young leaders particularly at a time now of such uncertainty? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, good question. I mean, it's very, uh, it, it's definitely not easy for young people, particularly young people who either have started small businesses or either are trying to get a job. Uh, so it's important to really um, keep in touch with the even the NGOs in, within your country. Um, so if I were to really to speak about the UAE uh, and its ongoing initiatives, uh, we have volunteer programs at the Emirates Foundation. Uh, Emirates Foundation is our federal foundation for youth development. This gives youth purpose and certainty in an uncertain year. And so if you're a young person who's out of job, who's looking for a job, 
it's important to find something that keeps your focus there. Volunteering is very, very crucial at this point. Um, another program, again, within the United Arab Emirates that we at Young Arab Leaders uh, started is the mentorship program. Uh, and this mentorship program for young entrepreneurs, it's where they're matched with mentors and uh, with people who have relevant expertise and experience to help grow those particular startups. So, for example, if you are a young entrepreneur, if you can find uh, an NGO or a an incubator within your country uh, that is happy to put you through a mentorship program. Again, that's something that will give you purpose within a very difficult year. Uh, and I, I really would think that corporations need to continue to provide inspiring internships uh, and programs for youth, because again, this will give purpose to young people coming into these big corporates and perhaps these internships then result in jobs. Um, and at university level, I would like to see more job readiness programs, uh, you know, for young people. Again, giving them that foot in the door with some of the big corporations, perhaps through an internship. Oh, I think you're so right there, Mona, when we look at, you know, how important mentorship is, internship. And again, it's about getting that flavor and getting that bit of experience, you know, in, in a safe place where, you know, you're there and you've been mentored and you're being encouraged and you're being advised. And it really can make such a difference to people. And I think, you know, I've been through this myself and with many people that I even put in uh, internships too. It's the encouragement that they can actually get and uh, to move forward. And it is part and parcel, I think, of education to do it too. We're going to be wrapping up shortly, but I have a question that few people are actually asking as well. So it's, you know, coming back to the business in terms of the significant growth opportunities that really have emerged in the retail ecosystem. And this, I think I have Sophie Caroline. I have, um, yeah, Sophie from Dubai has actually asked me this one twice. So in mm -hmm. terms of, I suppose, the future of the retail business, where we can wrap up on this, you know, what's to be done and where are, I suppose, the bright sparks that will keep everybody going and keep everybody shopping. Mm, absolutely. Um, again, you know, going back to the point of, of, of your brands being very relevant, um, and your brands, you know, young customers right now are conscious consumers, right, Athna? If you think about it, they're very much into researching, um, uh, you know, a product. They're very much into wanting to kind of connect with a brand that is um, uh, th that has a good story to it, uh, that's an ethical brand. And so I think it's really important to have retailers think about what brands are they selling, uh, whether they're sustainable brands, whether the source of the products are, let's say, you know, a sustainable uh, wooden toy from a forest that's, you know, sustainable, or whether it may be, um, you know, a certain a company that has highly ethical uh, policies when it comes to, let's say, employees and the way they treat their employees. So I think that it's a lot more uh, sort of thought process needs to be done into the whole uh, retail uh, sector and also having excellent um, uh, digital presence, excellent, um, you know, you know, you look at your, your phone every day and you do a bit of research immediately before even going to the store. So having your online presence to be at the best quality. I think that would really bring back people into the stores because it meant it means that you know, they're not just relying on something that they remember from pre-pandemic years. Yeah, it really is. the. It's become the digital shop window, so to speak. And you're so right. And we're so used to getting all of that information now. So we want to have that at our fingertips. So it's up to all of the retailers. And it's an easy one when you think about it, you know, to make it really clear what you're doing. And again, put that added value, I suppose, in many ways. Um, Mona, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really been a delight to have you with us and good luck with all of the great work you're doing. Um, you know, just keeping the business going, all of the philanthropic work you're doing, the mentorship work, the young Arab leaders. I mean, there's so much going on. So we really wish you, you know, great luck and uh, all the support that we can offer. Well, thank you very much, Athna. And it's been a pleasure to be able to really speak about my experience here and uh, wonderful to be here. So great, thank you so much. That was Muna al -Gurg. Of course, Muna is the Director of Retail at SSL Alberg Group. So it's been a real honor to have her here really bringing us up to date with such an important
to in the industry. It is uh, consumption and you know growth in uh, consumer buying power and all of that. This is what really keeps the wheels of industry going and keeps our economies growing. So it's great to hear that you've had a good year and always good to know what the group is doing as well on the wider scale. Once again, thank you so much. And to all of you watching, stay with ABLF. We'll be right back.